Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mark Plattner, the co-editor of the Journal of Democracy and Vice President for Research and Studies at the National Democracy. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's panel. As you must know by now, we've just published the 25th anniversary of the journal. And in fact, we'll have complimentary copies available for everyone at the reception that follows this panel. Uh, though it may not seem very fitting for what's supposed to be an anniversary celebration, we felt compelled to make the theme both of the issue and of this panel is democracy in decline. Why? Well, simply because we felt that today there's no escaping the widespread concern that animates this question. It's uh, on the lips of many people. I believe we've assembled an extraordinary collection of authors in our January 2015 issue, and we've been able to bring a number of them here today for this panel. You have full bios of our panelists in your programs, so I'll limit myself now to saying just a few words. Uh, Alina Manjupipidi on my right, uh, who's from the Herdy School of Governance in Berlin, is a leading authority both on post-communist Europe and on the issue of corruption. She's also been a prominent civil society activist in her native Romania. Tom Carruthers uh, of the Carnegie Endowment is an eminent and globally respected expert on the subject of democracy assistance. Steve Levitsky of Harvard uh, and Luke and Way of Toronto on the far left and are two outstanding younger scholars of comparative politics. They're particularly well known for their co-authored book on competitive authoritarianism. Steve is a specialist on Latin America and Lukin on the former Soviet Union. And of course, Larry Diamond of Stanford uh, is my co-editor of the journal, and I'd say he's widely recognized as one of the world's foremost experts on democratization. We intend to conduct this panel in a conversational format rather than with set presentations. We'll try to complete the initial part of the discussion by about 5.30 or so, that we, so that we can leave about half an hour for questions and comments from the audience. Those of you on Twitter can follow the proceedings and contribute to the conversation by using the hashtag JOD25 or by following the forum at Think Democracy and the endowment at NE Democracy. And now let me ask you all to join me in silencing your cell phones if you haven't done so already. This may take a moment. <laughs> Incorrect password. I, I told you to get an iPhone, Mark. <laughs> Done. Uh, now, as I note in my introductory essay uh, to the January issue, there are really two aspects to the question of whether democracy is in decline. And although they're intertwined, they're also, to some extent at least, separable. The first deals with what is actually taking place on the ground, the kinds of things that Freedom House tries to measure every year in its annual survey. How many countries are democratic? Is there a number rising or falling? What is the situation with respect to such liberal democratic features as freedom of the press or rule of law or free and fair elections? But there's a second, more subject, subjective aspect that asks about the standing of democracy in the world. How is it viewed in terms of legitimacy and attractiveness? It's this second aspect, I think, where the evidence, or at least the perception, of democratic decline is most I don't know if any of our authors would really contest this, and this is a dimension we'll explore later on. But first, we're going to turn to the first aspect that I mentioned, where there's a real controversy in our pages, with Steve Levitsky and Luke Way having written an essay entitled The Myth of Democratic Recession. 
and Larry Diamond countering with an essay that argues for the necessity of facing up to the reality of democratic recession. And I propose discussion at this point. And at first, what I'd like to ask is Steve and or Lucan, in whatever combination, but keeping it brief, to briefly outline why it is that they think the democratic recession is a myth. So, Gay, I'll start off. Um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a real honor. Um, Steve and I were undergraduates when this journal began, so, uh, and we're no longer undergraduates. Uh, no, it's a, it's, it's a real, I think, a concern today among scholars and observers that democracy is, is in decline. Uh, numerous observers have just suggested that democracy is plummeting. Even the New Republic has written about the great democracy meltdown, although the New Republic has also suffered its own meltdown. <laughs> uh, aside. Uh, some even see the beginning of decline democracy even in, in the West. Uh, Freedom House has reported declines over the last nine years. This, but there are good theoretical reasons for this pessimism. Robert Kagan points out in, the, in this issue that dem democracy was, was brought about by the rise of global Western hegemony, and that's obviously under threat. Uh, first of all, the West has experienced extraordinary economic crisis. To put it mildly, <laughs> democracy in the, in the United States is not exactly very healthy with um, enormous stalemate and polarization. And even we predicted democratic decline in the last paragraph of our, of our book when we noted the rise of new counter hegemons in China and Russia. Now, they lead to the, to, um, they threaten democratic decline because they give autocracies room for maneuver and they directly ch challenge democracy promotion. So there would seem to be, and then finally, of course, you have an extraordinarily aggressive Russia today. I don't need to say this, which is accompanied by a rise in cynicism about democracy promotion. I can tell you this you know, is especially um, prevalent in the former Soviet Union. So all this would seem to confirm that democracy in is in decline. But the problem is that is it isn't. There is simply the data does not support that. Even Freedom House's own numbers show minimal decline at most. So in 2000, there were 86 democracies in the world. In 2005, there were 89 democracies. Today, there are, as of the latest Freedom House that just came out, there are, drum roll, 89 democracies, exactly the same as in 2005. It's true that the, the Freedom House score between one and seven has declined about one or two percentage points, but this is not a recession, it's a rounding error. And a similar picture emerges from other major democratic ratings, Economic Intelligence Unit, Polity, Bertelsmann Index, the VDEM, all basically show the same picture. It's true that the number of democracies in the world has not increased, but it has also not declined. We've seen real democratic decline in places like Venezuela and Thailand, but at the same time, that's also been matched by real improvements in places like Tunisia, Moldova, and most re recently, it looks like Sri Lanka. Even Ukraine, which is beset by num numerous crises, is much more democratic than it was a year ago. And, and what's most remarkable is that democracy has survived in many places where few theories predict it would, such as Benin and the Dominican Republic. So if there's so real, little real evidence of decline, why is the perception of decline so prevalent? And that's something that Steve is gonna touch on. <laughs> okay, as Luca mentioned, uh, we were college students when the first issue of Journal of Oxford came out. I was actually an undergraduate at Stanford taking Larry Diamond's class on democracy <laughs> when the first issue of the Journal of Democracy came out. I was uh, very, very impressed with it at the time, and so it's a, a real honor to be here arguing with Larry today. <laughs> um, I know this was supposed to be conversational. I, I brought notes. Without my notes, I'm like a teleprompter, so <laughs> I'm going to have to use my notes. So the question is, if, if democracy has basically flatlined over the last decade, why the perception of democratic re recession? We point to two factors. The first is what we call a collective misunderstanding of many of the regime changes of the early 1990s. The 1990s, the, 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 the immediate aftermath of the end of the Cold War, were a period of unprecedented authoritarian crisis. Soviet Union collapsed, the, the West begins to promote democracy seriously for the first time, severe economic crisis pushes many states to the brink of collapse, in fact, many states to collapse. 
The result was widespread regime instability, authoritarian instability, particularly in Africa and the former Soviet Union. These authoritarian crises were widely interpreted, widely viewed, widely assumed to be incipient democratization. Whenever an autocrat fell, their new regime was called a new democracy. Whenever an autocratic regime held, for the first time, multi-party elections, the regime was considered to be in transition, one way or another, to democracy. But many of these regimes were not even remotely democratic. And, in, and to boot, many of them emerged, many of these transitions emerged under conditions that were extraordinarily unfavorable for democracy. Collapsed states, minuscule private sectors, virtually non-existent opposition and civil society. I'm talking about countries like Angola, Azerbaijan, Burundi, Cambodia, Cameroon, Central Africa, uh, Gabon, Georgia, Guinea-Bissau, Haiti, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Madagascar, Mali, Niger, Congo, DRC. Many of these are cases of state collapse. But back in the heady days of the early 1990s, when all roads seemed to lead to democracy, they were assumed to be somewhere on that road to democracy. 10, 15 years later, we look back at these, or we look at these cases, and we see instability or authoritarian reconsolidation, and we call it democratic retreat, but it's not. Because Kazakhstan, Guinea-Bissau, uh, Haiti, Central African Republic were never on the road to democracy to begin with. That's one factor. Perceptions of democratic recession, we argue, are also rooted in disappointment over the lack of continued democratic expansion in the world. Many of the people who claim that democracy is in retreat today actually don't focus on democratic retreat. They focus on the absence of democratic progress over the last decade. China failed to democratize. Kazakhstan didn't carry out democratic reforms. The Middle East is still authoritarian. But non-democratization in China, the Middle East, and Central Asia is not evidence of democratic recession. In fact, it shouldn't be very surprising. By the by about 10 years ago, nearly every country with minimally favorable conditions for democracy had already democratized. In other words, with the, a, a handful of exceptions, the low-hanging fruit had all been picked. A very large body of research suggests that stable democratization is very unlikely in very poor countries with weak states, like much of Sub-Saharan or in dynastic monarchies with oil, like the Persian Gulf or in party-based regimes with strong states and high growth rates, like China, Malaysia, Singapore. Our own recent research suggests that democratization is less likely in regimes born of violent revolution. China, Vietnam, Laos, Cuba, Iran, Korea, Ethiopia, Eritrea. Given that most of the world's remaining authoritarian regimes fall into one of these categories, the recent lack of democratic expansion shouldn't surprise us. It may be unpleasant from a normative standpoint, I don't like it, but it's entirely consistent with existing theory. We can root for democratization, we should root for democratization in Libya, in Iraq, in Burundi, in Afghanistan. But expectations of democratization in these cases lacks any theoretical or empirical foundation. And the dashing of unfounded expectations should not be confused with democratic recession. A Couple of points on the democratic recession that isn't. First of all, many of the democratic breakdowns that we've seen over the last decade have been either partially or fully reversed. Nepal's 2005 coup was reversed. His democratic erosion arguably has been reversed under Aquino. Mali's coup was reversed. Yanukovych fell in Ukraine. Electoral rule was restored in Honduras. And it looks like Sri Lanka's autocratic turn may also be reversed. So while there have been some democratic breakdowns in the last decade, what's really striking, in my view anyway, is how few of them turned out to be long-term authoritarian reversions. Second, and I will stop, I want to reiterate a point made by Philippe Schmitter in the 25th anniversary issue. And that is that we often fail to give credit for advances made in existing democracies. In the mid-2000s, Chile eliminated unelected senators and established full civilian control over the military. A huge democratic advance. Um, clear case of democratic progress. <coughs> Not a peep from Freedom House in its <laughs> annual report. Yeah. Democracy in Brazil and in India, two very big, 
very important countries in highly unequal societies have deepened concerns over the last decade. They've become more inclusionary. They've become less elitist, more participatory. Brazil's judicial and legislative institutions have improved considerably over the last 10 or 15 years. Brazil and in India are a big freaking deal, to quote the <laughs> vice president. And yet these gains are often overlooked in discussions of the global state of democracy. We're too busy talking about Venezuela. So when the Journal of Democracy was launched back in 1990, Freedom House classified 38 uh, developing and post-communist countries as fully free. Today that number stands, or at least in 2013, that number stood at 60. 25 years ago, when I was an undergrad in Larry's class, new democracies in Central Europe and in Latin America were widely viewed as precarious. Many very good scholars were very skeptical that many of those regimes would survive. Yet most of them have now survived for 25 years or more. These outcomes, to me, suggest an alternative way of viewing the last decade. As Kagan uh, makes very clear in his piece in the 25th issue, uh, 25th anniversary issue, global developments in the last decade pose a serious threat to new democracies. So crisis in the West, the growing power and self-confidence of China and Russia, soaring oil prices, at least until recently. Yet the actual long-term democratic breakdowns is strikingly low. So it may be that the real story of the last decade is not democracy's retreat, but it's surprising resilience. Thank you, Steve. Larry, I assume you have uh, something to say in response. Well, the main thing I would say is that I feel, from a purely debating standpoint, like I'm in a win-win situation. Um, because if I succeed in persuading people here that we're in a democratic recession, I've done okay. And if people find Steve's remarks extremely compelling, the reason why he's so compelling is that I trained him. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, I think that um, we could have an interesting and I think important and fruitful debate um, about where to draw the line uh, between authoritarianism and democracy. I don't think this is the place to do it here and it would detain us, um, but I, I say and I'll say here, my article, um, I don't think there is or can be one right answer to this. So the reason why you two come to 89 as your count for democracy and Freedom House in its uh, latest survey of freedom in the world comes to, I think, 121, something like that, is that you're counting only free states that you know, have an average Freedom House score of no uh, worse than 2.5 on the seven-point scale as democracies. And anything that is partly free, which I think would include the Philippines and Mexico now, you're not counting as democracies. I actually think that's a defensible position. I don't agree, it's not the way I work it. I think that um, uh, one of the contributions I think Lucan and Steve have made uh, in their book, Com uh, Competitive Authoritarianism, which I have an extremely high regard for, uh, and in the work they've done since, and in their article is really push us to think about, which I think all of the panelists on this panel have in hard uh, uh, ways, about the boundary. What, what constitutes a democracy? What are the minimum conditions? I mean, I think that there are countries that are not fully rated as free by Freedom House, including the two I mentioned, that we need to recognize as electoral democracies. But to some extent, the boundary is somewhat artificial, and uh, I don't want to get too detained on it here. Secondly, um, I love uh, I, I just think it's indispensable, and I rely on the annual survey uh, very heavily in my work over the years, as uh, my students would know, and colleagues and friends as well. Uh, but no survey is infallible. No survey is perfect. I've found that Freedom House, I think, has been tardy in um, recognizing declines in democracy. Uh, and often by several years, they were scoring Russia as a democracy until 2005. And Venezuela, too late as well, and Nigeria for a while. Uh, and I actually, after rereading pieces of uh, 
of your book moved Nigeria out of the category of ever having been a democracy in the last uh, 12 years. And I will say as a concession to my uh, uh, now dear colleagues, uh, you know, reclassified some other countries as well. So we need to have this, um, this really kind of searching conversation about what constitutes this democracy. But my point is, wherever you draw the line, um, I think what you have to, what I think is inescapable, is significant, not catastrophic yet, and hopefully never to be, but significant and I feel uh, gathering erosion. So let me say why. Um, first of all, uh, I think that um, we need to distinguish between small states and big states. Now you've mentioned two of the big, biggest, and I agree. I think that um, Brazil I don't know nearly as well as I feel I've got some sense of what's happening in India. I think it's a really promising moment in India. And uh, if Prime Minister Modi succeeds in reviving the economy, it could be a transformative one. But if you just kind of disaggregate all of the countries into the wor in the world into countries below one million uh, population and above one million population, you see not only the same thing I saw 20 years ago, which is a stunningly higher incidence of both democracy and especially liberal democracy in the small states, but all of the gains of democracy in the last 10 years being in countries under population. And now I'm basically taking democracy not as free states, but more or less as electoral democracy uh, as Freedom House de defines it, but maybe with a slightly higher standard. So in 2005, uh, of the states under one million uh, population, 79% were democracies by this definition. At the end of last year, 90%. That's kind of an amazing figure when you think about it. In 2005, 57% of the states with more than one million population were um, elected democracies. In 2014, it was 55%. I don't think a decline of two percentage points in the democracy presence in the world among the bigger states it, you know, is much of a recession either. You pretty much take that as a stagnation if it weren't for these other things. And so let me go through them. First of all, I think that there uh, is a downward draft that's very worrisome in some very big and powerful and strategic states that Freedom House is not yet adequately recognizing. I, I just think Turkey was and no longer is a democracy. Now, Turkey's been the poster child for the ability to reconcile Islam and democracy uh, in, uh, in Muslim-majority countries. And that's a big failure. That's a big strategic and historically significant failure. And I think Erdogan is increasingly pr prime minister, now president, shedding his restraints, shedding his, the clothing he's been wearing to dupe the West, which is not a view I had, say, seven or eight years ago, and is just a kind of creeping Putin-esque figure. I'm not even sure you know, his Islamic conservatism, if you want to characterize it very conservatively, is what's driving it. I just think it's the old-fashioned will to hegemony. But it's increasingly overt. I, I think democracy is in suspension in Bangladesh which is another one of the five most populous Muslim majority countries as a result of the breakdown in electoral procedures and the opposition boycott, things we could talk about. We know there's been a military coup in Thailand, but you know, if you just look events at numbers, you miss some things. And here's one thing. Thailand has now the most authoritarian military government. This is not your usual kind of in and out in a year or two military intervention. This is nasty uh, and looks longer lasting. Uh, and in uh, Egypt as well, this is not, not even Mubarak's Egypt. It's a whole lot worse. So uh, as they cited, you know, the, and Freedom House keeps saying now, it's nine consecutive years of, um, of more countries losing in freedom than gaining. So this brings me to my second point. First of all, the balance between 
losers and gainers, it's not just that the countries that are declining outnumber the ones that are gaining. It's a big gap. It's been two to one almost every year in the last nine years. And we are not adequately seeing, again, to criticize my friends that I so heavily rely on, Freedom House, we are not witnessing the extent of erosion of freedom and the quality of governance that I think is happening on the ground. I think there are coming changes underway in South Africa now, where Zoom is just turning it into a highly neo-patrimonial, clientelistic, and profoundly corrupt government. You guys don't think Botswana ever was a democracy, but however you rate a very kind of sui generi political system, say 10 or 15 years ago, no one who's been looking at Botswana, who I think knows the country, disagree, disagrees with the proposition that it's less democratic today than it was five or ten years ago. And why? Because of what's happening in so many places. You get, you know, uh, rulers who have um, authoritarian tendencies, don't want opposition, uh, want to dominate, don't want to leave power, have illiberal tendencies, or in many cases, I don't know enough to say this is true of President Ian Common, Botswana are massively corrupt and, and don't want accountability for their ability to accumulate wealth. In short, in a word, what Frank has written about in his book and in his article for the journal Neopatrimonial Tendencies. I don't think there's a single country on the continent of Africa where democracy is consolidated. Benin, I think, has done really pretty well, but you know, look at the population of Benin. South Africa, I think, is in real trouble. Nigeria is on, the, which I concede has never been a democracy, but you know, it's hurtling towards state failure right now. We may have another massive political crisis in the world in the coming weeks. I'm worried about Ghana where um, you know, it's been the poster child of democracy in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And predictably, we could get into this later, as a result of the gush of petroleum wealth, uh, corruption is seeping in, governance is deteriorating, and you have all these problems. Then look at Europe. I'll leave Europe to my friends. <laughs> and I'll just say two words for my friends to uh, my right on this stage to elaborate on uh, as they wish. Word one. Hungary, word two, Greece. Uh, finally, uh, let me just mention two other things because my colleague Mark is very indulgent and he shouldn't be. Uh, number one, um, I think another element of what's happening is that the countries that are authoritarian, so now we're not just talking about a recession of democracy in terms of more or less democracies. We're talking about a recession of democraticness of the extent, vigor of freedom and democracy in the world. So I think a lot of what's happening is that um, democracies are becoming less democratic, or um, not all of them. I think your two cases are valid. And I think Indonesia averted a disaster in the recent elections. And I'm, I'm kind of hopeful now, but it's, it's a crucial case that could still go in either direction. And I just totally agree. I was shocked when Rajapaksa lost the presidential election in Sri Lanka. And I think it's one of the most hopeful things to happen uh, for democracy in the world in many years. Um, but you know, Russia, a lot of the other countries you look at in post-Soviet space, uh, well, Venezuela was already pretty bad. Many of the authoritarian countries in the world are becoming more so. And if you look at the Arab world, and compare, we know the Arab Spring has imploded, except for Tunisia, which I'm also hopeful about. But the majority of Arab countries, by the Freedom House ratings alone, are more authoritarian today than they were uh, at the time of the Arab Spring. One brief final thing. Um, one reason why there's this, it's not even just by the numbers, it's kind of a gestalt, it's a zeitgeist, it's just a gathering sense that democracy is back on its heels in trouble. And the other big reason why is what's happening here in the United States, uh, in the European Union. It's not like Japan is doing so well either. And um, uh, in two senses, number one that, well, let's not get into it, but democracy is not performing well in the United States. <laughs> I think generally that is a defensible proposition in this room. 
And secondly, I think the resolve, the willingness that was there for a long time of the established democracies in the world to promote democracy and defend democracy is really in, in serious and alarming retreat. Alarming because I believe we are in a period of recession of freedom, let's say, and it really needs a lot of help and defense. And I, I'm really worried. Uh, I think we're on the cusp of something very, very dark and frightening. Uh, and that if we don't develop a strategy to counter what's happening even below the surface, below the numbers, in terms of this authoritarian drift and creep, where the current sense is it's the authoritarian regimes like the ones you mentioned that have the dynamism, the power, the self-confidence, and not democracies, I think we're going to see an acceleration of what I think has been for the last number of years um, at least a mild recession of democracy in the world. Thank you, Larry. Uh, <clears throat> on the democracy promotion issue, I want to finish up our discussion with that. But <clears throat> do you, either you, Tom, or Alina want to respond to what's been said so far? I wouldn't. Tom? Okay. No, thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> very intelligent people disagreeing with each other so much. <clears throat> One explanation might be, but it proves not to be true, is that they're economists. And you know how economists, <laughs> <laughs> economists have a wonderful ability to sit and talk to each other about the same reality and sound like they're describing two different planets with utmost certainty. Um, but they're not. They're, they're political scientists, so it's, <laughs> we can't turn to that explanation. <clears throat> thank thank you think, for not hurling that at the Fed, I guess. <laughs> I think they're disagreeing with each other for three reasons, just to help navigate this debate a little bit. <clears throat> First is a kind of almost a simple numerical one, is that when you read their articles carefully, and they're trem tremendous articles, both of them, Larry is tending to focus on measuring from 2005 to the present, and they're focusing on measuring from 1999 or 2000 to the present. So it's actually a simple thing that if you start at 2000 and look at the present, the numbers are what they are. If you look, start at 2005, they look a little more like you're going downhill. That's one reason. Not a big reason, but it's important. The second is <clears throat> Uh, Luca and Steve have a, a greater attachment to the numbers. And if you will, it would sound critical if I said it to a certain formalist analysis. Whereas Larry is trying to go behind the numbers and talk about what he feels. Um, but there's, there's something legitimate, I think, to what Larry's doing because some of the numbers don't tell you very much. For example, when you say that, for example, Mali is now back in the democracy camp, Nevertheless, what happened in 2011 and 12 in Mali certainly gives one a shaky feeling about the health of democracy in Mali that one didn't have 10 years ago when it looked like it was a poster child. The same with Honduras. Yes, the coup in Honduras was reversed, but to put it in simple terms, if you know much about what's happening in Honduras, if Honduras is your idea of good news or stability, <laughs> you know, it's hard to feel comfortable about that. And so some of the numbers that you guys point to feel less certain when you go behind them. But on the other hand, you have the, the advantage of the numbers is that you avoid the tendency, which I think you're absolutely right about, of people first to pay more attention to bad news than to good news, which is certainly the case. Good news in Sri Lanka doesn't carry far compared to bad news in Thailand, for example. And in addition, to focus on special cases, as you say, the inordinate publicity around certain cases like Russia and Venezuela, which are important, but that. So a second reason they're disagreeing is their, their attachment to the numbers in a certain sense. And the third reason is a deeper and a bigger reason, which is they're disagreeing about whether the number of democracies in the world is the way one should measure the health of democracy in the world, in a sense. And Larry is saying there are other factors like the fact that the West is not doing very well democratically itself, even though it's not dropping on the Freedom House scores, that authoritarian powers are resurgent and more self-confident, makes him feel that democracy is in a less good state in the world. So they're, they're not talking about the same thing. When they say, is democracy in decline, they're defining it much more narrowly, whereas Larry is talking about something bigger about the health of democracy. So those are why these very intelligent <laughs> people are disagreeing with each other. Just <clears throat> pick one bone. Um, it's a small one, but I think actually it goes to the core of something that's very important in the difference between the outlooks of, of, of you guys, which is when you go back to the 1990s, uh, Lucan and Steve are making a very powerful argument that 
we misunderstood the 1990s, and rather than seeing it as a decade of democratic expansion and sort of the democratic moment in the world, it was, as you say in your article, the perfect storm of authoritarian crisis and collapse in those years. That we really should understand the 1990s as a time when authoritarianism was in trouble, not that democracy was gaining so much ground. Whereas Larry, I think, has been very much a proponent of the view that the 1990s was a, a key moment in democracy's expansion and see it that way. I'm, you know, of course, I'm sympathetic to your point of view because the end of the transition paradigm article that I wrote was very much of that view of saying we're overestimating the fact that many of the countries that appear to be on a path to democracy shouldn't be seen that way. But I think you're a little bit in danger of throwing at least a few babies out with that bathwater. And let me point to a couple of cases that are, I think, just emblematic of your view that, and it's very revealing when you name the three reasons why authoritarianism was in crisis in the 1990s, two are internal about fiscal crises, one about state collapse, but the third one you mentioned is international pressure for democracy, is though it really was just that pressure, international pressure to hold multi-party elections was goading these states to have elections. And I think you're underestimating in some places that there really was a sense of democratic moment. It wasn't just state collapse. I would take Zambia, which is one of the cases that you mentioned on the list of countries that really shouldn't be seen as ever having been in a democratic transition. In 1990, the movement for multi-party democracy in Zambia was real. It was a democratic movement. And there was a sense in the country of we're gonna finally try to, after you know, the failure of the one-party state in Zambia, to move forward. And I think there are at least a few cases that you're, you're sort of throwing out and saying it was all really just authoritarian collapse that really were emblematic of something bigger that was happening in the 1990s that was a sense of democratic spirit. Similarly, Russia, big case, a touchy case, but you're saying, you use the, the term, which I think is a powerful one, the analytic concept of pluralism by default, that Russia was a good example of a country that didn't really experience any democratizing moment in the early 1990s. It was just pluralistic because the state couldn't gain full control, the state was too weak. Again, I think that sells short a little bit what was happening in Russia in those years. No, there wasn't a robust popular movement for democracy, but I do think there was, in a sense, some embrace of the idea that Russia can finally try to make a real sort of go at becoming democratic. So I like your, you know, I'm torn. I like your central point that we shouldn't overestimate these attempted transitions, and that's very much in mind with some of my thinking, but you went several steps farther that I think causes to go back and look at the 1990s, and that's a fundamental issue. We need to come to terms with this and settle our thinking about that. That is a real debate between you two. Liam, do you want to step in here, or? I just want to make a remark about this. Uh, I do not know why Larry mentioned Greece, you know. Uh, as an East European and partly Greek, my last name is Greek, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> I must say, despite the fact of being an adept of austerity, that what happened in Greece is perfectly democratic. We have been for many, many years uh, criticizing the European Union for having a democratic deficit. But in fact, what we understood by democratic deficit and by narrowing the democratic deficit, that we wanted people to support what we do in Brussels more and more. So this is uh, where we failed. Now that somebody really voted against us and against Brussels policy, we don't know how to come to terms with this. But there's really absolutely nothing undemocratic about this. It is a challenge to a new type of governance, a new type of governance which basically removes from the decision of citizens certain decisions. It's very difficult to explain to citizens that crucial decisions for their countries are now taken elsewhere. I'm a technocrat, I believe in decisions taken elsewhere, but as a democracy <laughs> scholar, uh, I really can't say that this is something undemocratic. Democracy is on the side of Greeks. It's not at all on our side. So I, do, I would not really be worried uh, about Greece. And I really, you don't understand to what extent, now speaking as a corruption scholar, what Tsipras says that it's the end of oligarchy and this is what people voted, is exactly what made people vote for them. It's not only the debt question. He was voted in because all the whole political class and the left on the right was perceived as extraordinarily corrupt and particularistic and having spoiled the Greek state and the European money for generations, which is true that he's no better than them, this remains to be proven in the future, and I'm quite certain it's going to be proven fairly fast. But it really, you know, doesn't matter. I mean, people had the right to try something else. 
And uh, there's no way that we can say in, uh, in Brussels that uh, this is, again, European democracy. But, you know, where you can point to um, Greece and Hungary, and by the way, Hungary is a more complex example than people make out of it, and I really wouldn't like to see European Union uh, one day, uh, you know, launching an offensive in Hungary to restore democracy. I am absolutely convinced that Hungarians, as we are, have enough instruments to change their political regime once they will find a credible alternative to them. And the reason why they did not, it really should be studied a little bit more in depth before being so pessimistic about Hungary. But what about Tunisia and Romania, the two places where uh, which have been equally quoted a year or two years ago as problematic and where we won elections, you know, last fall? You can always find two bad places and two good places, depending <laughs> on, on your standpoint, all right? So I would say that uh, looking at, at it's not really something uh, which should be our, our concern, as long as we look at the total of the numbers. And the total of the numbers, again, from my perspective as a increasingly a corruption scholar, more than a democracy scholar, is wonderful. I mean, you still have 115-something countries which are electoral democracies. That's a great number when you think that you only have 38 countries which are not corrupt in the world. Okay, so you democracy people are really doing very well. <laughs> <laughs> if you could improve a little bit and produce less corrupt democracies, well, then we will talk some business. But so far, so far, I would say that, you know, what we see is, is not, not so depressing. What is really depressing and puzzling from my perspective is if you look at public opinion figures in countries that Stephen and Lucan quoted as successes in Brazil or in India, where a lot of majorities tend to be extraordinarily pessimistic and critical and saying that this is no good, they don't trust these institutions, they don't trust legislators, trust in political parties all over the world. If you look, it's zero, so you ask yourself, well, why is this? Why are the parties the least trusted institutions in the world? And how can democracy succeed in the, in the absence of parties? These are really very serious questions, you know, but the positive answer of this, again, I cite to be an optimist, it's nothing better for, for your mood than winning some elections. And then you have a few very good months, as I have now after the Romanian elections. <laughs> what happened is that uh, people in, in this country simply demand have grown a lot for quality democracy. If you followed, for instance, the anti-corruption movements in both Brazil and India, which are really now like grassroots movements, all the former democracy movement have now turned into anti-corruption. And what people say is they basically say, well, you know, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, we rallied for free elections. But now we want more than this. We want to see where our money are going. We no longer want the money to go into expensive soccer stadium. We want our money into education. We want our money into health. These are simply far more difficult things to deliver. But the good news is that this is genuine demand. This is demand shared by more and more and more people. Now, we haven't reached the critical mass everywhere. But we are really building up this critical mass, particularly in these two countries, in India and Brazil. Of course, they're complicated countries. I mean, collective action at such a huge scale, it's a tremendous problem. But what is important is to see beyond this pessimism. People want more, and none of them would say in any survey that they conceive of another alternative than democracy of delivering this better quality of public services and at return for their money. And this is, I think, you know, quite, quite a gain. Where I would say that Larry is, is perfectly right to be a little bit pessimistic is on Turkey. And uh, you see this quite a lot that you have schemes these days, again, I'm afraid this is, you know, this is about corruption, schemes which do not look democratic at first, but which are extremely, extremely uh, non-democratic, by which dictators, people who are apparently you know, po uh, populist leaders, let's call them better than dictators, come up with ways of redistributing public funds, particularly through public contracts, or in the case of Turkey, through public-private corrupt partnerships, basically rents, in a way that they manage to buy the media. And this is quite extraordinary. These two schemes are nearly identical in Hungary and Turkey. How without you will not read this any news in, in any newspaper? But if you research it the way we do, you will immediately find evidence that this is how these people buy electoral support. In other ways, they are very, very good. They master the democratic game. They manage to win votes by winning the media, and they manage to win media by just giving to some tycoons state contracts and telling them, please buy this television, or please buy this newspaper, which is in my opposition, and make it more friendly. 
This is a fantastic coup. I mean, it's the Berlusconi model all over again, but it's now making quite a lot of, of proselytes, and it's working very, very well. Well, but it's in the end of day, uh, it's working because there is no alternative yet to this media. In the end of the day, it's working because it's people in these countries who get into this and who vote for these dictators. So again, I would not really say that uh, this is a defeat of, of democracy. You can trick voters, you can cheat voters, and you can unfortunately buy votes, which I think is the most problematic thing. But in all of this, in the end of the day, still people get to vote, and you can still fight for their vote and come up with alternative ways of going around these obstacles. So yes, I would say that I'm rather an optimist in this panel. Right. Well, I'm <coughs> glad you raised the question of governance. I mean, Larry in his essay says that you know the big problem facing democracies these days is bad governance. Frank makes it the focus of his uh, entire article. And he has one striking sentence, the legitimacy of many democracies around the world depends less on the deepening of their democratic institutions than on their ability to provide high-level governance. <coughs> on the other hand, he's also, I would say, a skeptic in the article about whether demand from civil society is sufficient uh, cause, uh, provides uh, sufficient impetus to correct the situation. And, and I wonder what your response would be to that, uh, Lena. Well, I would, I would say, well, I never said it is a sufficient condition, to be honest. I would say that it's a necessary condition, but you cannot really doubt it. If you look at former Soviet Union, which is part of the world. In charts, if you aggregate the World Bank charts of control of corruption, it falls underneath sub-Saharan Africa, which is far more poor, so we, you would expect it to do worse, right? And if you look at this part of the world, you see that it's a near perfect correlation, which is between the development of civil society in Central Asia, for instance, right, or in the Caucasus, development of civil society and the quality of governance. If there is no demand, that's not going to be good governance, period. There's absolutely no way that you can build this from outside through advice, through money, through enlightened dictatorship. Now, is this sufficient once this exists? Here is where collective action problems start and where, of course, we see increasingly that countries which are smaller or more culturally homogenous, like Estonia or a small country like Costa Rica somehow find it easier to build this than do countries like Brazil and India, which are very big and complicated, right? And this is where I work on, on collective action and solving governance problems. And I, of course, acknowledge that uh, it is uh, an extremely, extremely complicated problem. But I think that the demand thing is... Uh, is a crucial thing. There are several other things which I can quote to prove this. We have a, a very uh, high correlation, for instance, between internet users in a country and control of corruption. It's a correlation of 90%. So in other words, foundations who just give computers to countries really contribute towards democratization. <laughs> you know, people who take care that in every village an internet uh, connected computer exists, which is accessible to everybody, it's in the village pub or whatever, really make a major contribution to democracy and to good governance. Because through that computer, for the first time, people connect their government, connect to other people. It's a fantastic tool for both knowledge and building collective action. Number of Facebook users per country is very strongly correlated with control of corruption these days. And it's a fantastic proxy for collective action because definitely it's not for people posting their stupid photos on Facebook, <laughs> but simply by being able now and then to reach out to other people through the same mean and tell them, come on, I see you in Taksim Square this yeah, evening. Okay. And this is really extraordinary, right? Okay. My original country has quite strong captive media. It's 90% of media, you don't know who's financing it. So obviously it's not a good place for democracy, right? And still we were able to circumvent these last elections due to millions of people who came to Facebook. Our newly elected president is the leader in the Europe with the highest number of users in Facebook. He only got them last fall in one electoral campaign. He has one and a half million people, followers on Facebook. In a country where only 10 million vote, so this is really something in a few weeks, it's enough. You no longer need the media afterwards. You just, 
get to, you know, multiply by three, and you'll find out the number of households. You get to a large number of voters. So, um, you know, without being sufficient, I think that this is really the element which simply cannot miss uh, from this ingredient. Yeah. Can I just re respond about Greece, clarify what I was saying? I, I'm not saying that public's electoral rejection of the kind of European Union terms is a bad thing for democracy. I think whenever there's popular sovereignty in the narrow sense, it's, it's progress. And I think any kick in the pants to a, <clears throat> a party, party multi-party establishment as profoundly uh, corrupt as the Greek one has been, which we documented in an article in the Journal of Democracy, is also, in that sense, progress. I am not an expert. I defer to you. You're the European on the panel, and um, you know the region deeply. But I'm very worried about this new government in a few respects. Um, First of all, uh, you know, I think the trend toward ideological polarization um, is worrisome. Uh, I think, you know, ironically, you know, the left and the right got together, so you could say how polarized could it be, but look at who was getting together and look at what the right is, and now this kind of recent analysis that suggests a kind of um, affinity between the new Greek government and Putin, I, I really think is dangerous and disturbing. Right, well, I'm a little surprised at your reaction, but uh, it could be because of my ignorance. That brings us to the uh, subject of <clears throat> external factors. And uh, one of the things that's really emphasized uh, in the issue too is the changes in geopolitics that have happened in, in recent years. Um, I see someone's champing at the bit to yeah. respond we can't, to that. We can't talk so. about governance? <laughs> you can do that, can too. Can I just answer this thing about yeah, yeah. Putin? Putin is just supporting all, all populist groups in the European Parliament, or most of them. So the logic is a bit the other way around. He's simply investing in whoever he perceives might be a contender of the EU order or of the Western order. This is how it happens. And when people are still on the rise, they just, you know, accept support from everybody. This doesn't mean that these people are KGB created or, or anything like this. It's just sheer opportunism. And it's amazing. They support people in, uh, you know, they support parties. They have ties in far older democracies and more consolidated than Greece. People who take this, take this Even uh, support. Even people who were prime ministers of major democracies. <laughs> so, can so I just want to actually uh, <coughs> talk about authoritarian promotion because that's another aspect which I think has created a lot of pessimism is the sort of no longer, you know, or sort of Russia sort of a timid uh, in, the, in the back of the room. They're sort of become a very dominant presence. And there's been a lot of discussion, you know, in, at NED and elsewhere about the threat of authoritarian promotion, which I think is a real, imp really important issue. But I've looked at this a little bit closely. There's a couple things. One, people like Putin do not care about regime type. What they care about is economics and geopolitics. They don't care whether the pro-Russian candidate was elected through free and fair elections or elected through yeah. fraud. And in fact, what you find, what that means is that they have actually almost zero impact on the growth of authoritarianism in the region. Thus, they've been very happy to support the opposition as in Georgia in 2013 or in Kyrgyzstan as in 2010, when, they're, you know, when in a sense you could argue that Russia helped democracy in Kyrgyzstan because it overthrew Bakiyev, an autocrat, right? Who would have thought? Uh, Putin the Democrat. Um, <laughs> And when they have supported autocracy, you know, very much so as in Ukraine, they've often failed, both in 2000 and in, in 2014. So, in fact, when you look more closely, it's not clear at all that, and certainly, and the same thing with China, I mean, there's really little evidence that China is particularly interested in, uh, in exporting kind of authoritarianism per se. They just want people, they want governments that are friendly um, to geopolitical interests. So in this sense, I mean, this is where I really like Kagan's article, but I think his comparison with interwar Europe is wrong in this count. There is no self-confident um, authoritarian ideology in the world equivalent to Nazism and communism. And there is, of course, radical Islam, but that has very limited regional appeal. So I think that's a really big difference. And I think, so in a sense, it, it partly explains why, despite this sort of, you know, I think 
what Larry is describing is absolutely true that you know, the zeitgeist is awful right now about democratization. <laughs> but maybe this is, has a kind of, you could sort of turn that into optimism, is to say that democracy even survives without good zeitgeist. <laughs> so maybe you know, zeitgeist is overrated. Chuck Lugan. Or, or to put it another way, it's, put it another way. Let me way. try to say something. It, it's true that ideology is no longer a factor in the same way, right. that the motives of the Russians and the Chinese are not to promote a, an alternative kind of regime. But I would say that doesn't mean that the impact of their activities geopolitically, a kind of undermining of the Western liberal order doesn't have a profound effect on the uh, well, situation could, could. of democracy internally. Right, you could, it could. It's an empirical question. I don't think it does. I don't think the evidence is there that it does. But Tom. Mm -hmm. I mean, I appreciate what you say, Lucan, about it, we shouldn't have a superficial concept of autocracy promotion and assume that autocrats promote autocracy and trying to promote regimes that are friendly to their security interests. But undertake a thought experiment. Suppose over the last 15 years, Russian democracy, the incipient democracy of the early 1990s had succeeded. And for the last 15 years in Central Asia and the Caucasus and the Western former Soviet Union, you'd had a thriving democracy in Russia. What effect that might have had on the health of the Central Asian republics in terms of their own experiments and what's been happening in the Caucasus and what's been happening in the Western former Soviet Union. I think it's true that Russia hasn't necessarily said, I want to have an autocracy in Kyrgyzstan right now. But as we know from looking at other regions where we see a strong contagion effect, if you have particularly the most important country in the region by far radiating out a successful example of one model, surely the former, ex former Soviet Union would be in a more democratic state today, even if Russia isn't actively promoting autocracy. So therefore, the success and assertiveness of Russia over the last 10 or 12 years or perceived success and certainly I think nevertheless has had a negative effect on the state of democracy in the former Soviet Union. Look, regime outcomes primarily have domestic causes. To, to believe that, that a, a more democratic Russia would bring about a democratic Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan, I, I think that's an overstatement, to say the least. Um, this is not 1991. The United States, the, the, the liberal West, is not the virtual hegemon that it was 25 years ago. Um, Russia and China are going to balance against the United States. That's basic geopolitics. And, I, I, and But I think Lucan's point is important that in spite of this, there has not yet emerged, and this is my reason for optimism, there is yet to emerge a viable alternative to liberal democracy. So always autocrats who accumulate, concentrate, abuse power, when they fall, when they fall into crisis, when they are removed, the default alternative is always competitive elections. There is not, an, yet at least, a viable alternative out there. When that happens, I will start to worry much more. But you know, the one place, that, the, the region that I know, the one place where there has been a bit of an, alter, an ideologically driven promotion of an alternative regime type is Latin America, where the Chavez government did promote this sort of Bolivarian alternative. It's not all that authoritarian, but it, it's, it's certainly what Lucan and I would call competitive authoritarian. And, you know, similar regimes emerge, softer, but similar regimes emerge in Nicaragua, Bolivia, and Ecuador. They failed in, in, in Honduras, and, and Venezuela is going to hell. Nobody in Latin America thinks Venezuela is a model anymore. To, still in Latin America, there, there's a lot of variation in terms of the success and the performance of democracies, very, very few people in Latin America think there's an alternative out there, a viable alternative to liberal democracy. So in this sort of Churchillian sense, democracy continues to do OK. The point you make, though, is that it hasn't happened yet. And let's hope it doesn't. But I would say that this past year, I would say I was an optimist until 2014. Uh, <laughs> and the actions of Russia, of China, of the uh, uh, Islamic uh, State and so on have uh, made me now uh, very, at, at the least cautious if not pessimistic. But on the question of the impact of the, uh, on the zeitgeist of these things, let me 
uh, quote a sentence from an article that uh, Gianodia, this very uh, uh, interesting Georgian political scientist, uh, something he wrote in the journal, uh, I think around 96 or 97, where he says, why do transitions a major reason is imitation, which is what political scientists are talking about when they use terms like demonstration effect and diffusion. And he says, the greatest victory of democracy in the modern world is that for one reason or another, it has become fashionable. To live under autocracy or even to be an autocrat seems backward, uncivilized, distasteful, not quite comme il faut, in a word, uncool. <laughs> in a world where democracy is synonymous less with freedom than with civilization itself, nobody can wait to be ready for democracy. Now, nobody, I think, could write this today. Something fundamental has changed. I think, you know, now pop stars go to sing for authoritarian dictators in, uh, in the former Soviet Union. There is not this sense that democracy is the only way, the only civilized way that can operate. Now, you know, I'm not sure I can fully account for the reasons for that change, although I think geopolitics has a lot to do with it and just the general passivity of, of the West plus bad governance and so on. But I think, again, there's something fundamental has changed in that way. I don't, know, I really don't know if something fundamental changed. I mean, what you, what we should also well, let me remark, ask you yeah. about Eastern Europe in this respect, because in your article you talk about the new border between Russia and the EU, sort of dividing what seemed like they would be stable blocks. But just this past week we had some people who know Eastern Europe very well uh, speaking to us at, at the endowment. Uh, and suggesting that certainly Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and not to mention Hungary, had powerful pro-Russian sentiments in parts of the population, and that one should by no means feel that these countries were securely in the democratic camp. Is that too alarmist? Or Yes, it is. <laughs> in short, yes, yes it is. Not from all from afar. Uh, no, no, uh, I think uh, it's rather difficult for a country like Bulgaria with its economic difficulties simply to handle some issues like energy issue. And what you will find is that uh, they sometimes try to, to solve, but again it's in the interest of democracy. They try to solve the issue of getting cheap gas in order to be re-elected, right? So again, why is support in energy for, why support for EU energy policy versus Russia, something that we now include in uh, proof of, of democratic behavior. It's not that, that. Just, it's just more did. sympathy for Russia in the Russia-Ukraine confrontation rather than... Ah, sympathy for around. Russia in the Russia-Ukraine confrontation. I see, I see. Well, first, there's little evidence mm. on this. Second, even this Ukraine-Russia confrontation is more complicated than you see it in the United States. I worked as a UN expert in Crimea, so I knew for years, I knew for 15 years that Crimea is an entirely Russian place. I was there during the first Orange Revolution when they were trying to secede. This is, was their main concern. Since I was a UN expert, I got to discuss very openly with them, with all this autonomous republic, practically elected authority by the Russians living there. And uh, I ask them, really, so you feel that you're not really belonging with this new Ukraine uh, led by Mr. Yushchenko? No, no, absolutely not, absolutely not. And they disregard us and people have questions here in Crimea for us. And then I was very perversely saying, so why don't you, you know, just do what you feel like you ought to do? <laughs> like, go, you know, go. The Russia doesn't let us was the answer, you know, they wouldn't have let us, they wouldn't recognize us, Russia doesn't want any destabilization in Crimea, they'll try to work with Ukraine as it is, so they basically told us to stay put. This was the basic line, but all the ingredients that we have seen last year were already there. They already had this paramilitary called Cossacks who were registered as some sort of NGOs with hundreds of guns and trainings. I interviewed them, and this is quite many years ago. 
I interviewed them and they discussed with them and they even just told me that, you know, they're obviously former military types, probably still military types. So it is a bit complicated uh, to say that, uh, you know, I mean, of course it's a breach of international law and everything, but this was just a deal. The deal was that Ukraine doesn't go west and then they get to keep Crimea. Right? The, everyone knew that they would lose it the moment when this will change, and this is what happened. This kind of nuance doesn't really get through. I'm not saying at all that Crimea should be in Russia. Crimea should be in Europe. It has fantastic Genoese castles, Byzantine castles. We should <laughs> reclaim it for its castles. It's really European civilization. But then I believe that Russia should be in Europe as well, all right? It's them who don't want to be in Europe. And, who always put this, this borders right. between well, we us. We could have a long discussion. You see. <laughs> issue, but so why don't, one, why one don't... re reason is that I do not th really think that um, uh, p there is unreasonable anti-Western sentiment in any, in any East European country. Rather, what you see is that dictators are spending, well, not in Eastern Europe, but in other countries, are spending quite a lot of money these days to look more democratic and legitimize themselves. Nobody mentioned this. But look of United Arab Emirates or uh, Qatar and uh, the money they invest into good governance and into consultations. Now they have more consultations on policy issues than some democratic countries do, right? Because they, they realize the necessity of, of, of looking good, which is another way of saying that democracy is not that weak. It won the normative battles. Dictators try to pretend they can solve people. I agree it won, but I'm not sure the victory is now secure. I think, Mark, you let's are. Let's turn to Tom, and I hope you'll get into the democracy promotion. Okay, let me just say a word about that. I think you are slipping across a, a conceptual boundary that's dangerous, and I agree with what, what Steve said, is the fact that a country decides it wants to be friendly to Russia in certain ways or for certain reasons is not the same as democratic backsliding. And, you know, I was in Brazil recently meeting with the Brazilian foreign ministry and we were talking about Ukraine and they said, of course we sided with Russia, you know, because we had to be on the other side from the United States because that's what the Brazilian foreign ministry does. You know, that's, um, that wasn't a sign of democratic backsliding in Brazil. It, honest. It wasn't. It, it has to do with their perspective on the multipolarity of power and that's different. Now, they're not completely separate, as Bob Kagan said in his article, but I think you have to be careful about slipping completely across that boundary. Now, about democracy promotion, um, the implications for some of the things we're talking about, there, there are one or two that I'd highlight. <clears throat> the first is I'd pick up on the concept, which I think is a valuable one. You put it in just colloquial terms of low-hanging fruit having been already, in a sense, harvested in the first 20 years by the democracy assistance community. The assistance community is now facing the fact that most of the countries they're working in are not low-hanging fruit. They're countries that have structural reasons that make democracy extremely hard. And they have one of two characteristics. Either they've already reconsolidated into some kind of semi-authoritarian or authoritarian rule, or else they have a lot of elections, but citizens feel governance isn't working while they might be like South Africans sliding in a bad direction and so forth. So the democracy assistance community, in a deep way, has to be, and I use this word with caution because it can be misunderstood, more oppositional than it used to be. In a sense that if you're working in a place where power has already reconsolidated, you have to find a way to help those who'd like to unconsolidate that power do so. That can be perceived as being very partisan. It's, it's not necessarily partisan. Is it a good example is the Clean Romania campaign that Alina led in Romania. It was trying to help make sure power doesn't consolidate in unhealthy ways in Romania. And it was not a partisan campaign per se. It was based on certain values about alternation of power and about good governance. And the democracy assistance community, though, has to be more, quote, you know, politically engaged in helping people challenge power. And that causes people to be very upset. And the reason we see so much against democracy assistance in parts of the world is it can no longer just move in the direction and say, we'll help you with those elections you want to hold, hold, we'll help you with your state reform. It has to say, you're stuck. You're either stuck with consolidated power this bad or you're stuck with an empty electoral process and people need to be empowered to change that. And democracy assistance is therefore about empowerment, challenge, and opposition in a nonpartisan sense. And that puts the democracy assistance community in a more difficult relationship to power holders and one that the power holders don't really want. And that's where the community is today. Can I just make yeah. three points? And I promise it'll be under a minute. Yeah, one, I, I know, I agree with everything that Tom just said. And I think that it really needs to guide our, our strategy for democracy and governance assistance going forward. 
Number two, <clears throat> one reason why it's so important, uh, and this is, augurs a little bit more on the optimistic side, if you look at the public opinion data, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, there's no significant erosion in the preference for democracy, the popular preference for democracy, which is at a level that's far beyond what we would predict from our theories of uh, socioeconomic development and its impact on democracy, political culture, and everything. But there is a huge and growing, so in public opinion, it is growing, gap between the demand for democracy and what the people perceive to be the supply of democracy on the ground. And I think the driver of that is what we've been talking about, what you just were talking about, what Alina's been working on, which you have uh, addressed in your works, and what's a theme of Frank's article here in his book, which is bad governance, corruption, neo-patrimonialism, uh, self-seeking elite behavior, which drives the will toward political hegemony. Use your term. And I think that's where the battle is going to be. But I don't see us fighting or waging that battle right now. And um, certainly the Chinese and the Russians are playing into it. There is another way in which the, um, the Chinese and Russians are subversive of democracy right now. And it's not because they are aiming to subvert democracy per se. I do agree with you. They don't have a Nazi-style agenda of trying to promote overtly authoritarian regimes, but the effect of going in there and buying off everybody that they can, corruptly subverting these governments to buy land, get contracts, all this stuff is having a corrosive effect on democracy. Uh, thank you all. Let's uh, give the audience a chance. Uh, please try to keep your questions brief and uh, identify yourself when you uh, begin. Do we have a mic for? Someone's there. <laughs> well, thank you very much. My name is Yaya Fanusi with the United States of Africa 2017 Project. I don't ask questions. I make a quick 60-second statement, which later on you ponder about it. It gives you a better idea of what, what you've been talking about. For Africa, our conception, popular conception, is what the gentleman <laughs> just stressed. Free and fair election, periodical overview of the governing party. And if we agree with them, we we'll keep them in the office we kick them out. The problem we have, you guys support the people, the elite, the governing elite that entrench and interfere with free and fair election. I am 72 years old. I know our struggle against the colonialists because we want to judge who led us and whether we agree on it. And that tradition has been going on up to now. So put that in your perspective when you're dealing with Africa. That's the way the people think about democracy. Thank you. We'll take a few questions and comments. Any others? You in the back? I think, I think Bill Leonard had his hand. Hi, thank you. This is, I'm Ilya Lazovsky with the Foreign Policy Magazine's Democracy Lab. My question is about democracy promotion, which hasn't really been talked about that much. And I guess if any of you could address it specifically in terms of Ukraine, which I think more than anywhere else on earth is really the front line right now between aggressive authoritarianism and a struggling new democracy trying to make some positive change. What can we do? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Thanks. Thank you. Another one in the back. I, I'm Mike Henning from USAID. I would just, on the democracy promotion side, uh, point folks, uh, especially the academic uh, members of the panel, towards the study that was done a few years back about uh, by Vanderbilt and Pittsburgh University that talked about the uh, increase of uh, democratic change than one would have otherwise had seen had there not been an in injection of some resources to promote democracy. So I think if, if you'd like to comment on that, I think that's an e a useful study to consider. Uh, we don't have causation there, but we do have some empirical data that shows that democracy assistance does lead to some, some sorts of changes. And I just wanted to question Mr. Levitsky's statement about some countries um, not being capable of democracy and we should otherwise not that. be surprised. Well, I mean, saying we shouldn't be surprised when we don't see democratic change in those places. Okay. I think that's very much a failure of imagination on the part of policymakers and, and on the part of democracy assistance providers to say, well, 
you know, Libya wasn't capable of it or uh, we shouldn't have expected there to be democracy, I think there should be a standard. Maybe it's not a, an empirical standard, but it certainly should be a policy standard that is possible anywhere in the world and, and everyone can work towards that. So. Okay. Hey, David? Uh, David Epstein. Uh, as I recall, I, I don't think anyone mentioned anything before 1990. And I'm wondering if any previous periods of history cast any light on this. Have there been previous moments when democracy was unfashionable or seemed to be declining? And was that different? OK. okay. Uh, all right, one more, and then we'll turn to the panel. Could you on the linkage between the decline of a democracy and limited. We have the transition, but the consolidation of a democracy, the consolidation, do you see that as a factor which explains the decline of a democracy in many developing countries? Thank you. Uh, okay, why don't we start at this end? Luke? So about uh, Ukraine, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think a lot of attention is paid to, to Russia and Putin. But frankly, there's not a lot we can do in this town to, to change Putin's behavior. He's going to do whatever he wants in the short run. Uh, but there's a lot we can do to affect Ukraine and, uh, on two fronts. First of all, I think regarding governance, um, you know, we have, Ukraine's in a situation more than it ever has been uh, as an independent state where it's really dependent on us and our aid, which gives us an enormous opportunity to help and force through a lot of governance reform to reduce corruption. I mean, here you have this huge opportunity. And I think um, the current government of Poroshenko is just not doing enough. There's um, remarkably little being done. So I think that, in that, you know, I think there's a lot more that could be done. That needs to be the focus. And there's, a, in a sense, uh, I think around the Ukraine crisis, a bit too, crisis, a bit too much focus on geopolitics, which is obviously important. But in terms of what we can actually accomplish, I mean, our relationship with Ukraine, there's an enormous amount that we can accomplish with Ukraine. <laughs> you stay it. Really quickly, previous periods where democracy was not fashionable. The, the, the most important, the most obvious is the 1920s and 30s has been pointed out, where you had two different regime types promoted by very powerful states, uh, primarily Germany and the Soviet Union, uh, with, with, with great ideological zeal. So there, in that period, you had powerful ideological rivals to liberal democracy. That was the greatest threat in the last century to liberal democracy far and away. In the Americas, in the 1960s and 70s, following the Cuban Revolution, you had an alternative model. For the left, Cuba became a model. And that was also a threat to liberal democracy. That kind of alternative doesn't exist today. I think we are in a, a Churchillian moment in that people throughout much of the world don't think all that much of democracy or their democracy, um, but don't have an alternative. Democracy by default? Um, on. Uh, on, uh, on uh, imagining democracy in, in Libya. My, my, we learned with the third wave that, that uh, the, the old structural theories of the 60s announced the developing world essentially structurally unfit for democracy. That's out the window. Uh, we, we, we now know that democracy can emerge anywhere. But that does not mean, and my point is this, that we should expect it to occur everywhere and then be disappointed when it doesn't happen. We, I, you can imagine democracy in Libya all you want. Just don't be surprised when it doesn't happen. <laughs> OK, well, I would just uh, summarize, maybe not put words in Lucan's mouth, but maybe kind of frame his response to words. Conditioned aid. I think that there are two countries in the world that we, the West, the democratic West should bet extremely heavily on now uh, as potential strategic turning points back in the better direction. One is Ukraine, I think it's obvious, and the other is Tunisia, and I think that should be obvious too. It's the only Arab democracy right now. We've been waiting 40 years for an Arab democracy. Now we actually have one. Uh, and it, its economic situation might not be quite as perilous as UK, Ukraine's, and it, it's not facing national disintegration at the moment, but it's, it's actually in pretty difficult and challenged shape. But um, I totally agree with what Lucan said. Ukrainian Democrats have been saying the same exact thing to me and I think to a number of us, which is engage the Poroshenko government, promise them 
very extensive economic assistance. And I want to say, uh, I don't know whoever in the room will agree with me, but military assistance as well. But um, it's got to be conditioned on concrete and pretty pushy governance reforms. And I think that we've got a chance here because um, there's a lot of evidence that when leaders and governments are backed up against the wall, facing an existential crisis, and it's a choice between reform and survival or no reform and maybe the whole project, their rule, and even their country uh, uh, caving in, that they do the right thing even if it's for the wrong reasons. And in the end, I don't care why the right thing as long as they do it. Um, on Africa, I would just say that, um, uh, yes, we need free and fair elections. That is obvious. I think that, you know, the, the U.S. is kind of weakly on uh, the right side here. But I think our attention has been distracted way too much by al-Shabaab, uh, now Boko Haram, all the other issues of the war on terror. And in the end, we're not going to get organic stability in Kenya uh, or in the Horn of Africa. We're not going to get organic stability in Nigeria. God knows I'm convinced of this without movement toward better governance. And we just will not, period, will not <coughs> see better governance in Sub-Saharan Africa in the absence of pr pretty serious democracy for reasons that I hope are obvious and people on the panel uh, uh, have written about. Thank you. Alina? Well, uh, first I like this point about uh, other times when people really thought that democracy is over. I think that this is a good way of putting things in perspective. I don't think we live the worst. When I was living as an adolescent behind the Iron Curtain, I read a book by a French uh, analyst, um, Jean-Francois Revel, whose name was uh, How Democracies Perish. It was written in the 70s, and it was really very gloomy because it felt that uh, Russia was winning the Cold War and the West was losing it basically due to inadequacy and absence of strong responses from, from Western countries. And, uh, you know, it was less than 15 years after we celebrated our, uh, our big victory <coughs> and the fall of the Berlin Wall. So there are other times, I think, even more challenging than this. The problem that I really think we're confronting today, the only problem that I see, is that we never managed to solve Russia. This is not a new war with Russia that we have. It's the same war that was over and over again. Russia is the only empire which was really never defeated. Even in its years of democracy, they still continue to preach in newspapers from nearly all political parties and in school through education textbooks the fact that they have the legitimate right to a sphere of influence. Right? I have grand grandparents who returned from Siberia when I was one, so I've always lived in the neighborhood of Russia. Russia never changed its mentality, and they never lost in 1989. I mean, they considered a part of empire because they couldn't hold it. Then we pushed and pushed NATO, and in the end of the day, they really did not lose enough to get lost of this conception that they are entitled to an empire. And that is something that we didn't really manage to handle. So we're simply you know, continuing something that we haven't finished and which you see that it's very costly in Syria, in Brazil, and wherever, we're still battling at this. So this is something that we're going to leave to the next generation. What can democracy promotion do in Ukraine under these circumstances? Ukraine is simply not a matter of democracy promotion anymore. In the same way that, uh, you know, I mean, why is it a matter of of democracy at all, the condition of democracy, that you have to have a nation, a political nation. You have to have a group of people who want to live together under the same government and within the same borders. If this precondition is not fulfilled, there's nothing that you as a democracy promoter can do in Bosnia or elsewhere, or you know, occupy them forever and force them to live to forever. And this is something that we simply cannot sell in Ukraine. In Ukraine, although now it's a very bad moment, what we will have to do is to negotiate where Europe ends, when, where Russia starts, with Russia. Of course, it's not a good moment to negotiate with them when they acted so unilaterally. At the end of the day, we will have to come to that. Don't imagine we will be able to push NATO further east again. We won't. We just pushed it when history gave us this opportunity as far as we could, and that's the end of it. And we were probably wrong to push 
You were wrong to threaten that NATO in Ukraine and Georgia, where we could not anyway. So it was vain, you know, threat on part of us, and we only provoked them. And we provoked an opponent that we have never managed to fully defeat. Now, can we really defeat them economically? That is another discussion. If we can, I would say let's try. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure we can. And believe me, that you, you challenge some East European countries. But in Germany, people, for instance, are very critical of Americans, a lot. And they say, why have Americans Ukra encouraged Ukraine when they knew we can't support them to the bitter end? Because we're not going to you know, go with war in Russia, with Russia over Ukraine. Right? And this is another way which I think is, is legitimate to think of this. So what we can do as democracy promoter in Ukraine, where I also worked, and I care for these people, I built this Chesno coalition with support of many donors, some of which I see here, uh, is to protect our people. That's the best we can do, protest, protect our people, keep them alive over the next years, are going to be very difficult years. But that's not a matter of of really, of democracy promotion. It's just a war going on and we have to support our side for a better day, which is not next. Forgive me. For Tom, <clears throat> whenever I follow you and speaking, Alina, my, you, you stir up a lot of thoughts. And, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, let me just say one thing about Ukraine. You know, the, the West has been staggering around over the last year saying, what would be the price tag to really assist Ukraine? And people have come up with this $15 billion price tag. It's a lot of money. And people are just, oh my gosh, where are we going to find $15 billion? It's incomprehensible. And this goes to the zeitgeist of the time. It was last year that one small or getting bigger American company, actually almost one person, Mark Zuckerberg, paid $19 billion in cash for a mobile app called WhatsApp. <laughs> one American could somehow come up with the money out of his back pocket to buy an app for more than the entire West can come up with to help a country of almost 50 million people. What does that say about the zeitgeist? Well, uh, <laughs> let, let me just as a concluding note say that... Uh, you knew what he was buying. <laughs> I'm glad that, was it you, Alina, who brought up the 1970s uh, because uh, it's true uh, it was a very discouraging time for democracy, and even if the third wave was somehow in hiding, getting started in uh, Portugal and Spain, it did seem in many ways as if economically, geopolitically, and so on, that the West was really in retreat. And it was only 15 years till that got turned around decisively. Exactly what made that turnaround start, I think, is very hard to uh, identify. But uh, it gives one hope that it can happen again. So uh, thank you all for joining us. There will be a reception. That way. Thank you. We invite you to come to the reception, which is in the Paris room, it's called. You go 